I'm Lisa Haysha and welcome to the Legacy Interviews. Today I have Louisa Justice Dunn and Larry Dunn. They're both musicians and producers and writers and they have worked for decades. They don't look at it, <laughs> but they have. She's so kind. Yes, and um, he, Larry has worked with Earth, Wind and & Fire and I'm very familiar with that band. We won't go there, but we will let Larry okay. speak. But I'm very excited to have them here because I'm huge fans and I love the work that you've done. Thank what you've you. contributed to the world is amazing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So tell me a little bit. How did you get started? Uh, well, in music in general. Mm -hmm. um, I was born in Denver, Colorado. And uh, my mom was Italian. My father was African American. And uh, we had a raggedy upright piano in the living room. And my dad played guitar, bass, and piano. And he was also x-ray technician and a janitor at night. So he didn't have time to really do that full time. But he taught me different stuff. And I was, I, would just, I was drawn to the piano. So I would just beat on it, you know. Two years old. I think when I was about four or five, he taught me Blueberry Hill mm. by Fats Domino. Those of you who don't yes. know, it's an amazing American legend. And uh, blues guy, so I learned that, and then I just I just kept beating on it, beating on it. And I think about fourth grade, I got a guitar, and I learned all the Beatles stuff. And self-taught. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, he taught me on that the three chords, on the guitar, and I had a I remember a little chord book, and I would just lay in oh, there. Oh, that's learn terrific. It. You know, it so compared funny. to YouTube today. Oh right, everything's you know? on YouTube. I said if I'd have had that, no, I probably would have been a moron, but. Uh, yeah, it was just an amazing journey, and my mom side of the family being Italian, we'd go to North Denver, and um, they would sing the, the authentic Italian songs, stuff like that. And then my father had me listening to Jimmy Smith and Kenny Burrell and Ray Charles and all that. And it was just such a great time for music. Frank Sinatra, I listened to everything. Mm. So those were your inspirations. Oh, so yeah. when did you decide, this is what I want to do for my career? Oh, that's funny. Especially since your dad had several jobs, and how did that feel Well, to you? you know, at one point, you know, I went to Barrett uh, Elementary School, and I remember going up on the stage, and I looked at the lights, you know, and she'll tell you, I still, I just love lights. I'm a big kid, you know. And, but I just, I, I made a correlation between, I like lights, and I love music, and so I just kept just beating away at it. But uh, I think it was a casino ballroom. It was a five points area in Denver, which last week they just inducted me and some other people into that. Africa. Mm -hmm. Blair Caldwell African American Research Library, people from Denver who did cool things. So mm -hmm. that was like full circle. But it was a casino ballroom. I was like 11 years old. It was me and my brother Lonnie and my brother Stephen had a group called the Big D3. We had a little black and red and white turtlenecks. And I played the guitar and did Ray Charles and my older brother who was tall. And we had a girl, we had a ghetto drum set. We took a, a tambourine and we broke all the jingles off and took some duct tape and taped it to a little, uh, little stand and a symbol about this big. And my brother was, he was tall. And it was just amazing, this big guy sitting there with this little tiny <laughs> But anyway, we love music. And my, my younger brother just kind of mimicked on the guitar. So I did it. We won third place. Congratulations. We, we got our picture in the newspaper. Huge. $12 a piece. Wow. So I, I, I was telling him it was like, the, it was like the Steve Martin thing. He said, yes. I heard my first Montavani record. And I said, this is my music. These are my people. And, and you know, you got to stay up late with the adults. So that was it. I knew then I, that's what I wanted to do. And what was a struggle or a setback you had on this journey? One of your first struggles where you said, I can't do this, and then you just hunkered down and gave it a full try. Never. You know, Never? I, no. Actually, you know what? My mom, God bless her, told me, she said, I used to do these uh, recitals. Like I said, Denver was a great melting pot at that time. We had different nationalities on each side, and across the street there was a, uh, a middle-aged white lady who was incredible, who was a piano teacher. And I was so excited to do that. So I would go across the street like two, three times a week and study with her. And they had these little 
these little, uh, what are they called, busts mm -hmm. of the different Chopin and Bach, and, and I won every one. But I don't remember this, but my mom told me, she said, you know, a few times before the recitals, you would throw up. So that must have been part yes. of the, the struggle inside being being shy. But outside of that, I, I didn't care. But what about as a teenager or in your early 20s? You Teenager? You know, um, when you really started making this a career and you got your oh. first job and then maybe you didn't get a second for a while or you were struggling or starving and those stages. Well, the, the struggle actually came, not starving, starving, but when we got with Maurice, but I'll, I'll get to that. Not like it sounds, <laughs> but, but, you know, my mom, God bless her again, you know, my pop split when I was about 13. Okay. And that, now that was rough, you know, because, you know, they used to have father and son night, and I could look out the window and see the, the vet hospital where he was x-ray technician, and three years in a row, he, he wouldn't come across the street. So I had to go with somebody else's father. And then I remember he was like disappearing and not showing up. And, you know, back in the 50s, my mom never even knew how much he made. You know, mm. they would dish out the money. You women aren't having that today, are you? <laughs> At any rate, I <laughs> <laughs> As they laugh. But, but, but that, that was really, you know, it was disheartening. And then he was not showing. And one day he showed up and I had a gig to do at 13 years old. And he said, you know, you're not doing a gig or something. And I remember so clearly I got in his face. And I said, you already messed up my life. I said, you're not taking my music. And there was seven of us in a two bedroom house. So it was me, my older brother, my younger brother in one bedroom. And it was my two baby sisters, my mom and dad, in the other bedroom. And uh, I knew at this point that she was going to lose her husband, the house, the whole deal. And after I told him that, I don't know what happened. He was gone. And my two brothers and I that were sharing the bedroom, they were gone. And I went to that bedroom, and I dropped on my knees. I said, How God, old were you? 13. Okay. I said, God, help me make it so one day I could get my mom another house. And uh, six years later... 17, I just turned 18, I came out to play with Earth on Fire. Now, Philip and I had a band in Denver called Friends in Love, and we opened the show for Maurice, and then when, you know, when Maurice had the older guys from Chicago, yes. the two albums yes. on Warner Brothers, yes. yeah, we opened the show for them. So and you and Philip knew each other, Philip oh yeah. Bailey. I, I met, yes. I met, actually, I'm here at Wilson, who's my bass player, well, not my, but we played together since we were kids. I was 11 years old when I met Hilliard, and Hilliard was 13. Then a couple years later, we saw this band. We had a, the greatest instrumental band. We were doing Hugh Masekela, Grazing in the Grass, and Jimmy Smith and different stuff. And then we went to this center where they, you know, uh, people would go and kids could gather and hear music. And we saw this other band. There was three guys sitting on stools singing this beautiful three-part harmony song. And one of those guys was Philip. And so at that point, I was 13 and Philip was 15. So here and I pulled them in, you know, those singers, and we just went all over Denver and kicked booty. Mm. By the time I was 15, my little mommy, God bless her, she allowed me to play 21 and over nightclubs seven nights a week. And so at 15 years 15. old. 15. And the clubs let you do that. Well, hey, did they, they know your real age or? You bet your booty, they they could care less. You know why? Because <clears> we <throat> why? were packing it. They were, you know, they were. So they out. just looked the other way. Yeah, of course. Okay. Okay. Pay no attention to that. Right, <laughs> those kids. You know, and, and were you he, drinking or doing drugs? No, no. Okay, so you were clean. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I so mean, you are a professional, very young. Very young. Really took Philip it and seriously. I, and here you had Wilson, Larry Thompson, Carl Carwell. I mean, and like I tell people when I talk to kids now, I said, and back in those days, there was one prereq to be a member of a band that was simply you had to play your booty off. They didn't care if you were tall or short, fat or skinny, cute or ugly, black or white, blue green. You had to play. And, and that we did. And when Maurice and them saw us, my, I guess Maurice remembered. And so our band eventually broke up. I mean, you know, back in the day, the, there was a little marijuana thing, and my mom wanted to kill me when, about that. But, but uh, the main thrust was always music. And, and some of the other people around, there, they were taking Red Devils. I didn't even know what that was. I remember and, all uh, that stuff, Pink Ladies. And never. Yeah. And you know what? And when acid, some of the guys around me were taking acid. And I, I'm serious, it's like, you know, the Lord Almighty, my mom has been praying, said, Larry. I said, huh? <laughs> he said, you, you are acid. You don't need acid. 
Because, you know, I, 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 Good for I have her. So, so much energy, you know, I just always yes. have so much energy. And you believed her? You decided no drugs? Oh, uh, no, I just knew. Um, it's Did like, you do coke or anything like that? I remember a lot of the musicians that I knew back in the day said that they got paid with coke oh, no, under there, their doors no, and there hotel was, there rooms. Was no, there was and, no pay for that. I mean, there was, there was a couple of years where, you know, it was around, I dabbled in then. But then mm -hmm. I realized something, too. Uh, that didn't mix with music. Even like Richard Pryor said, you know, that you'd think all kinds of other weird stuff, but that had nothing to do with music. So, absolutely, we cut that out. And uh, but yeah, so so musically, like I said, it was just so cool in Denver because all we did was great music. I mean, and we were just young kids, but we took it so seriously. And so then, the band that Philip and I were in. Uh, Steve Sykes, here you had all the guys. We broke up, and Philip came out to L.A. and he was musical director for a gospel band called the Stovall Sisters. Mm. And then Maurice's Earth Wind and Fire broke up, and so Philip got with Reese, and they went through lots of musicians and blah blah How blah. How did you meet Reese? Uh, we opened the show. Uh, oh, th through that. Yeah, okay. we opened the show for Maurice and them at the Hilton Hotel in Denver. Okay. And after th that was that was an early show. I don't know why. But after that, Maurice and Verdine came down to 23rd Street East, which was a little black club we were playing in, 21 and over. Mm -hmm. And I was like 16 or something. And they came down and caught our act. So Maurice already knew, uh, you know, kind yes. of what we were about. So Philip got with Reese. They went to so many musicians and looking high and low. And then eventually, Philip came back to Denver to hang out. And I was with a bar band at that time, Sammy Mayfield. And... Uh, and Sammy is a great blues guitar. He's still there. His mom died when he was 12, so he really got into that. And he wanted me, after Philip and us broke up, he wanted me to be in his band. And I told him, I said, one condition, we have to rehearse. So later on, at age 21, I became musical director for The Fire because I like to rehearse. Mm. And uh, but So anyway, I, flew, I learned both of their albums by ear, even though I, took, I played baritone horn in school. Not sax, but looked like a little tuba. Uh, faked my butt off in stage band with guitar, and the guy was like, you're great. I was faking. Violin one year, and that was a disaster. Sounded like somebody was killing a cat. Uh, bass, but keyboards was always just a thing. Like, like I said, I, I kind of moved ahead. When I got that guitar in fourth grade, it was great. Then in sixth grade, my parents bought me an organ, and that's when I would sit in there and learn Jimmy Smith's jazz riffs. I'd slow the turntable down from 33 and a third to 16, which was half speed, mm -hmm. and you'd learn the riffs slowly, oh. speed it back up. God, old school, love yeah. it. You know, yes. now, you know what, now they have a, a plug-in called Amazing Slow Downer. Where, it, and you know where what, it's it, easier to do that. Yeah, I mean, That's and it, and it, you can stick any MP3 in there, and it doesn't do the Mickey Mouse thing. It slows it down, and you, it, it's, it's amazing technology, but hey, we figured it out, like you said, old school. So anyway. I love it. I think it goes deeper in just the reward of figuring it out yourself is just the self-confidence that comes out of that. So so now you're with Maurice. Did you think Earth, Wind & Fire was going to be as big as it was? Yeah. I mean, you never know on that level. But, you know, after I learned those two albums, because Philip went right to the phone, I took a 10-minute B3 solo. We opened the little bar band open for the group War. And uh, so I took a 10-minute organ solo, and Philip went right to the phone. And back in those days, they didn't have cell phones. If they did, they were like this. Right. <laughs> oh? I remember you know, those. Remember those? With, I and do. The antenna was Fair taller than say, you. I know it. Yeah, exactly. And so, but he went. But it was so cool. You could take it in your car. The FBI. Yeah. And so anyway, so he called Maurice and said, hey, I think we got the guy. You know, he said he's, uh, he can really play, you know, he's, and he's a, he's a good guy. He's a nice guy. He doesn't have that much experience, so I told Philip later, I said, hey, don't tell people I didn't have it. I was playing in clubs since I was a little tot. And so I acquired a Fender Rose piano from these Hispanic brothers. I think they wanted 100 bucks or 75, and I, I had 25, and like I said, back in Denver, if they ever see me, they're either going to go, hey, we're Bato, we're proud of you, or they're going to go. And with interest, that's right. one, million, <laughs> one million. But uh, so I learned all the tunes, flew out. Verdine picked me up, almost killed me, because he's coming down 
Century Boulevard, what I know now, I didn't know then, Century Boulevard, and I'm seeing the palm trees, and and all of a sudden, he's in this lane, and then he goes to the turning lane, okay, he's going to turn, then he goes over another lane, I'm like, ah! here, the, the traffic's coming right at us, and he went into the Magoo thing, he's mad at them, I'm like, Verdeen, I think you're in the wrong, great, mom, we got mangled up to, but anyway, we made it to the house, whipped out the piano, and uh, played a couple of Earth, Wind, and Fire. It was just me and Berdine, and Maurice was just sitting there and played a couple of things, Berdine and I. I played a little bit after that of Maiden Voyage by Herbie Hancock to show a little jazz. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was it. I was in. You were in. And how did that feel? Was this your first feeling of success? Or did you feel, it's another job, and... We'll see where it goes. Well, I was, you know, hey, I was blown away because, you know, you know what's so weird, Lisa, is that I was at a 7-Eleven on Colfax Avenue like two years prior, and I remember seeing there was a, a club called The Shapes that was down the block, and I could see it. And we had actually performed there with our bands, open for the staple singers and different people. But that night we weren't performing, and I looked over there and I saw the marquee and it said, Earth, Wind, and Fire. And I just froze for a sec. Go figure. And you just froze. I mean, I just, yeah. it just, I mean, there's no phenomenal words. Phenomenal band, yes. So yeah. how did you get along with Maurice White? And how did all, everyone get along? Because all these geniuses in a room, all probably strong personalities coming from their own world, so if you and Philip had, you know, worked together a little bit and everyone yes. worked with each other somewhat, but how did that go? Well, it, like, I, know like I said, it was phenomenal because when we opened for them, yes, we already knew their material. I mean, because we, I mean, we didn't, we hadn't played it, but maybe one song, Fan the Fire, but but we knew who they were and we loved it, the kalimba and the whole deal. And so uh, when we started working together, it was. I tell people, you know, because Maurice, you know, is very much into astrology. Me, not so much, but I could, I could walk up to you and go, "Oh, you're a Libra," and they go, "How do you know?" I'm like, I don't know, but I, but I know how I didn't like it because somebody goes, "Oh, you're a Gemini," so you know, you and I, we're not going to get along. I said, "You know, you're right." It's not, it's not because I'm a Gemini, it's because you have one of those IQs in the high single digits. But, uh, but we had a lot of respect and reverence for for Maurice, you know. And Amber Dean, you know, and Maurice. But I tell people, Maurice being a great drummer from Ramsey Lewis Trio, that was his, mm -hmm. his thing. And him and I were born six months apart to the day. Me, Juneteenth, for those of you who don't know, Juneteenth is the celebrated black holiday for the emancipation. So June 19th and Maurice, December 19th. Not to the year, but to the day. And him being a great drummer with such a great sense of rhythm and, and he was raised in the Baptist church and stuff. And then me being a keyboard player and organ and piano and different stuff, classical roots, jazz roots, R&B. Uh, we just wrote some great stuff together. I told people the story when he called me that we were going to be doing the uh, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And he was so funny. He said, man, we're going to be in this movie, you know. It's all Beatle material, and so I chose God to get you in my life. So he says, meet me down in the in the conference room. So we went down, and they had a, a little older piano, and they had a, a turntable. Anybody know what that is anymore? A turntable with the red Capitol Records 45. Oh, I love it. So we learned it, you know, yes. for five minutes, let alone. And then Maurice said, okay, we got it. So he goes, hey, man, I want to do one of those crazy intros like me and you just, he comes up with that drum so give me something crazy like bop 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 and i was i was so blessed i i was able to study a few years with walter bishop jr who lived in an apartment right across the street from the whiskey a go go and i would go up there and stay with him when i was 18 19 the 12 tone technique so right away he gave me that rhythm and i just hit it da 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 and he wanted to shuffle yes about 20 minutes later we were done we Finished the gig that night, flew to Colorado, and cut it the next day. That's impressive. That's how your writing sessions went, at least with this one? That one, yeah, no, uh, there's, there's always different ways. Like, Be Ever Wonderful, uh, I was 
had been out the night before, just went to a couple of clubs and whatever, and got in pretty late. You know, everybody goes to Fat Burger. Yes. And got in late, and then, you know, I was watching TV, so I didn't really go to sleep. And then it was really raining, and I went, I said, let me work. I went to the studio, and, and Maurice would always sing this at, at the sound check. Be ever wonderful. And so I just went in the studio, I had a little 8-track studio, and I turned it up, and did the whole thing. By noon, I called him cassette then over the eight track. I played it for him. He said, "Great." Gave him the cassette. He wrote the lyrics, the melody, and that was done. God, magic! So when you really get the right musicians together, it's incredible to be in a room watching this because you think a song like that would take two weeks, three weeks. You know, I work, have musician friends now, and they're like, "Oh, we've been working on this song for a month, and <laughs> <laughs> you know? we're still fine tuning it." And I, I've asked several people to write me a song for something I've needed. Oh, this is challenging, and it's like you know, five minutes, ten minutes, and well, yeah, a day. I mean, some so things was are it different? You know? Well, was it because you were so inspired, and because of the times and the company you were with? All of the above. All of the above, because sometimes when you're sitting alone, some of these people are by themselves trying to create, and really it's community and the synergy between oh, yeah. finding the right personalities and talents together. Well, like I said, we, you know, what was so great about it is that, you know, despite of towards the end there where there was a conflict of, of, of monet, monetizing and monetary stuff, the real deal is when we were out there doing it with the with the original members, there was a camaraderie, there was a brotherhood. I mean, we actually we grew up together. I was yes. I had just turned eighteen years old, and uh, Maurice I think was what like ten years older mm -hmm. than me or something, and and then the other Andrew, Philip, Johnny, Ralph were all like two years older than me. So we were, it was like a brotherhood and a, and a school a learning thing, and there was a lot of. We all respected each other's talent. We all probably brought in different talents too, where you learned off each other. Absolutely, yeah. you know, and and then for me to become musical director at 21 was just, and people said that must have been like frightening. I said no, because you've been doing I, it I knew, forever, right? I knew yes, my music, yes. and then you know I'm not really a singer, but God gave me a big mouth so I can. I didn't need a mic to shout across. Hey, Jack, you play that, you know, in the big rehearsal halls, and you play the G and. And uh, it was it's just a, uh, it was a it was a great great period. Yeah, and, and, and how long did audience, that run? Oh before? man, was that a? Well, so I was eighteen, and so and, and that was like nineteen seventy one, um, and <laughs> through uh, nineteen eighty two, I think was the last tour with all the original members. Eighty two. You can boogie down, and uh, but man, going through Europe and stuff like that in seventy five, opening for Santana. And, it was just, it was an awesome thing. So what advice would you give someone today who wants to do what you did or recreate something like that? Work. Work, okay. You know. <laughs> what about recreating that magic? How do you find the right partners and when do you know it's the right partners? Because I also know people who are older today who said, I, you know, jumped into bed with this person and it went to hell. And if I didn't choose that Ooh. partner, you know, metaphorically speaking, if I didn't choose that partner, I could have had the solo career or I could have, you know, it was between them or them and I chose them and that was the wrong choice because they ended up doing drugs and it fell through or wow. just, so how do you choose the right partners or how do you know you're on the right path or well, this is where I'm supposed to like land? Like I said, it, it takes me back to, like I said, when I was 13 and, and I dropped on my knees and I, I asked God, I said, please help me so I could get my mom into the house. So I think too is your motive. You know, Luis always says, you know, we're firm believers that God knows and sees the intentions of the heart. And like I said, I, we're talking. I believe that. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Uh, Amen. What's your, Absolutely. What's your, what's your name again? James. James. James and I were talking earlier when we came in, and we're talking about this this sense of entitlement that seems to be going yes. worldwide. Yes. And, and it has no bounds, age, none of that. Uh, nationality, race, there's this sense of entitlement that everybody wants the trappings, the things that come with years of success and work, but they, they, they go right past the work part. You, we all were raised knowing that old adage, there's no, there's no secret to, to success, two words, hard work. Yes. And, showing up. Uh, right, right. <laughs> you know, you so know, many people don't show up. I can't tell you how many people and, and I directed mad, a film and just people right? come. It's just like, really? 
Yeah, seriously, well, see, this is your big break and get lost, go. We I want still have to believe real. that there are some kids that, yeah. that have what They do, of the course, drive, there know? are some. But and what's sad is that I think no. they are, you know, they're made fun of. And they have to, they're made to feel guilty for their success so or sad. for having money. It's right. like, I worked hard. Right. No, you got lucky. Mm. No, no. It's now, you know not what? True. People tell me about her because they, you know, and she, t like I said, man, I, I've seen so much stuff from my mom working at Newsteaders, which was like a, a miniature Bullocks in Denver. And, you know, women still get treated like second class citizens all over the world. You know, the, the thing agree. with the, with the, some of the, the the sex over there, that let me get this right. If you see a woman's ankle, you gotta whoop her ass. Excuse my friend. Part of but, their hair. Yeah. Yeah. Right, you know, yeah. you know, yes. and, and then if yeah. she gets gang raped, you have you and Dad got to take her out because she brought shame upon our family. Mm -hmm. the, you know, that's that's a, that's a different uh, thinking, Very different thinking process. Yes, you know, and and I've just seen that. That's why, like I said, when I was thirteen, I wanted to help my mommy. The great thing. The uh, story on that is that I remember that that prayer was answered. When I was 19, I was able to go back to Denver when I got my, started really started getting my royalties and got her, my younger brother, my two baby sisters, beautiful home. And At 19? Yeah. And when, when, the, when, the, when I got with her in 83, then she became part of it and helped it, but we paid it off. And there, you know, there was there was some, some trying times. There were certain stuff happening, got a little scary, and then. Uh, and, but she told me, she said, "Larry, I'm gonna live and die in this home," and we paid it off. And she didn't. She passed 2010, mm -hmm. and it was so it was so great. She lived to be 90, and she knew that I was gonna be at the Songwriters Hall of Fame, where they inducted not Earth Wind and Fire per se, but the Maurice, Al McKay, myself, Philip, and Virginia White. Individual, okay. individual that's is songwriter, and mm, songwriters, songwriters. Yeah. And, and and in my speech again, I said I wanted to thank my mom, you know, for allowing me to do yeah. that, and and then of course my wife for putting up with me for thirty yeah. years, and you know, and so um, that is really part of my thing that people understand, you know, that it is not easy being a woman either. Yes. So you, know? you guys met in '83. How is it for you? How no, did we you... met way before that. Way before. Okay, so was she was a baby. Well, so was I. <laughs> so come on, I you guys old. have been married forever. <laughs> so how do you do it? What? What's, what's how old were you? I was, oh, what? When I first met Larry, I was about what, 15, 16, um, probably 15. But we just met, and it was very. Uh, one of the guys from the band. And I was uh, only 20, 20. Yeah. Uh, Romley. 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 No. The horn player, the Phoenix horn. Yeah, he and We were he friends, he him himself. and I, and he was dating one of my girlfriends. So I met him. He took us to the complex to meet. Did you do it to the complex? Yes. So yeah. Yes. I'm in the loop. So, <laughs> you know what? So like, amazing, baby. huh? Yeah. I was. He took me. Fake ideas. <laughs> right. <laughs> Everyone I knew had one. Turn it over. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the fake ideas. I remember those days. But when I went there with my girlfriend, Romney said, you know, Earth, Wind & Fire is looking for seamstress. I said, for what? Well, they need somebody to help. Some help. 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 And uh, the seamstress were kind of on break because they had been up all night. I said, well, how much are they paying? He said, $15. I said, $15? How cheap are they? No, did you, did you say per hour? And they went, no, No, 15? just $15. I said, well, you know what? I'm a starving student, so I'm going to go and, you know, hang with you. And I'll do it. And me and my girlfriend went down. We had some Earth, Wind & Fire pants, uniforms. And so I met... <laughs> They all came out, Romley came, and he introduced us to everybody in the group. And I saw Larry in the uh, reception area, and it's just, I saw him, and my heart dropped. I said, in my spirit, I knew, he's the one. He's the one. But I wasn't of age yet, and he was in a situation. Right, I, 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 I got married when I was 17. Yeah. You got married at 17? God, my, you my, did life fast. My, my mom had to sign the paper. She's like, Larry? 
I think you're too young. I'm like, hey, Mom, I, yeah. I put carpet in the duplex. I think, I think I know what I'm... Yeah, yeah. of course. If you could yeah. buy carpet, why yes. not? Yeah. And so I knew not to cross. Adults. I yeah. was too young, and I knew not to cross that situation because of my um, upbringing, religious part of being a Catholic. Yeah, but what about being Puerto Rican? <laughs> <laughs> my mother would kill me. <laughs> Puerto Rican, Cuban, and French. So. Yeah. <laughs> she said, don't you dare. No, but I knew not to go there. And then as time went, uh, years later, we, we were friends. And I would only get a phone call from Larry once or twice a year as a friend. Or he'll come by and see me. And it was always on a spiritual level. As a friend. As a, a friend, on a spiritual level, he would talk to me uh, about God. And I remember one day when he showed up when I was, in the place of contemplating suicide. Oh, yeah. She was How old were you? I was, uh, at that time, probably 17 at that point in time. She actually had 17. to run away from home because things were yes. bad at home. Yeah. Yes. So he showed up, and at that day, I was contemplating, and just, I don't know where he said, he, it was one day before uh, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Wow. And he said, you know what? Uh, he, I said, what you doing here? He's deep in the hole. I said, what are you doing there? He said, whatever you're thinking about, don't go and do it. He said, don't even contemplate doing it. And right there, he started just giving me uh, spiritual um, words. And he said, don't you know that you are worthy and that God has greater things for your life? And I said, okay. So my head was on midi in, midi out, and I could just hear God's voice telling me, go pack your stuff, go to New York, and just you're going to start your life there. And I told Larry, thank you so much. You are so sweet. I love you. Thank you for your word. But I wish you all the best. And, and then Let me just, miss you. Let no. me miss you. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, I didn't see him till like two or three years later after. That wasn't that deep. I mean, it was deep and for why me. Why didn't you see her for because, two or three years? Because she, she did, she did what, what, what God told her to do. She, she was in a bad situation. She went up, packed her stuff, and went back to New York. At, That's where she's from. At yeah. 17. Right. And then she was there for a while. And then. Who did you yeah. stay with there? 16 or 17. She, I stayed with my aunt. Okay. And a dear friend of mine in between uh, places. Vicenta? Uh, Vicenta? That's funny. Yeah. She was just dreaming about it. She told it yesterday. She had yeah. a dream about it. Wow. And so <laughs> she was like my second mother. And um, I lived there. And then something. And I almost. I was dating a guy. I almost married him. But something in my heart said, he's not the one. And I looked at him. I said, you know what? This ain't it. I'm going back to California. I'm going to find Going this guy. back to Cali. I was, Cali. my heart was saying, go back because he's the one. Wow. And then when he came. And you felt it too? In the words of Elvis, man, that's freaky, man. Did you no. feel it? <laughs> uh, you know, when, you, when, you, when she came back and I went, she had an apartment, went by to pick her up one day just to go for dinner or whatever. And yeah, then I was like, wow. And she was at the car. But why did you keep in touch with her when she was 15, 16? It was just a spiritual connection? Yeah. Yes, it was okay. a spiritual. And he was like mentoring me. Cause then, mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, when we started keeping in touch, she was like 17. Okay. You know, and like I said, I was only like 20, 21. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 22, maybe. Yeah. But he was always uh, giving me uh, words of encouragement, you know. And I just knew not to cross that line. But I said uh, to one of my girlfriends, she said, you know, you always say you fall in love with these guys. I said, I never say I, I love them. I, so I always say I like them. I said, but it's something about, I said, you know what? I just want somebody like him one day. Just one day. Oh, you got to tell the, the whole request. Oh, yeah. This, no, this was is my, deep. my request. I said, Lord, send me somebody who's going to love me, who is spiritually grounded, and Lord, somebody who don't like sports. <laughs> <laughs> I no, love it. That's my she got it. thing. You know what? Don't listen, like listen, listen, sports. Listen. I'm not a sports person. Listen, you're fine. Yes. Now listen. Now this is the thing. It's not that I don't like sports. We like sports. I like sports, but I'm not the Al Bundy. Okay. You know, if there's nothing else on there watching Lily, I should talk to my brothers in law. They're sitting there screaming at the screen and now, you know, my one of my nieces like that. They love it. The Broncos are I said, look, I said, you see all those guys running around on this thing? I said, they're getting paid. Right. I'm trying to think of some more ways so we can keep getting paid. And uh, her and I, we, you know, we played a lot of basketball. We played basketball. She talk, always brags about the time up at Indigo Ranch where she beat me in her high heels. I'm like, get over yourself. I, I let you win. Of course. 
<laughs> okay, I was tired. I have some excuse. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it's it's just been a, a great thing. And she started right there because uh, I heard her singing. So, so you guys decided, let's give it a go yeah. for a relationship at yeah. that. It just, it just fell into place. And, and then you realize she's a musician also. Yeah, and I heard musical her singing. abilities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because yeah. I work behind the scene, uh, in the music scene, being a, 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 in working in artist relation. So I knew about the administrator's part. I just didn't, I was too shy to be in the front. You know, people had told me, well, you know, you should be on the road, do this. And I was always shy, but he, Larry was the one who mentored me into the music part of it. And it's been such a, an amazing journey for me because the people that he had surrounded me with, um, all the you know, Beloit, Taylor, her and Beloit. Mm. You know, did you meet Beloit? No. The I guy didn't. that wrote Getaway for Earth, Wind, and no. Fire. Man, yeah. he passed he away this year, know. last year. Yeah. And uh, Roland Bautista. Who also and, passed away. Yeah, he passed away. And just great people that we, we have worked over the year has. I really sponged off of them because I was the one who always wanted more. Well, I, I want to do this. He said, no, 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 no. You got to do it the hard way, like everybody. It's like what we were talking about. Everybody yes. Everybody want all the, the, fast, the success. fast stuff, you know, right there on a silver platter. But no, but I, I had to learn the hard way that you have to work your way up to yes. get to that point. Yes, and, and, and I had to learn the hard way. And you know, it's funny because at some of the award show, when I really, you know, like I said, I when we got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I made sure I thank my mom, I thank my family, thank her, and of course the Phoenix Horns. Who I thought should were should have absolutely been inducted with us, but they weren't. Yeah. And and I always always give good uh, accolade and praise to Charles Stepney. I don't know, did you? You never mm -hmm. got to meet him. I did not meet him. Girl, that was deep. Oh. You know, he was Maurice. You know, and him, but him being a keyboard player, yes. I was just like that with him. And I remember the night, like on the the Spirit album, the title track Spirit. I wrote that when I was 21 years old, and the night that I finished it, it was like two in the morning. And some people had just come by, and they, and uh, the real musician hours then, and they were like, "Man, it's beautiful." I said, "Right, right, right, true that." But I got depressed, and most people that know me know I'm a huge goofball, and I usually go there. But I got depressed, and I had no idea. Three years later, Maurice called me, and he said, "You know that tune you gave me?" He said, "I wrote lyrics to it, and, and put it, you know, added some more melody." He said, I want to use it for the title track. I said, great. Two weeks later, we were cutting the basic track at Hollywood Sound, and I get the phone call, Charles Stephanie just passed away of a heart attack. So three years prior, I knew, but we didn't know. And that's what I tell people. As humans, I think we are, and that's, God bless you for your journey, what you're doing. There's so much in us that we miss because distractions yes. and different things. Yes. That if it wasn't yes. for that, yes. we, we would know, but... Man, that just I always tell people to expect miracles, but you have to be awake. Amen. That's why they don't; their life doesn't work because they're too busy. And it's like, no, you have to see. We're running out of that's a yeah. good. That's yeah. a good. I'm getting goosebumps. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I mean, that is Absolutely. so true. Yes. You know, we got to wrap this such up. Unfortunately, what do you guys want your legacy to be? Love, peace, joy, and integrity. Amen. That's right. Mm. And 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 whenever you're. Like, you know, this is what I say quickly about the real legacy of EWF as well. You take away the, the album covers and, and all the different, ooh, the lights and the whatever. Number one, great writers, great musicians, great production, but we rehearsed. And then the other thing is that our main message was, and I believe it still is, wherever you're at in life, raise. If you're in the gutter, raise. If you're a multi-billionaire, there's still something you can be doing yes. better. For all people to just raise. That's EWF's legacy, and that's the same for us. So if someone's in a real funk, how do they raise? If they have no money, they're just getting a divorce, and they're... Faith. Actually, we have a girl that's going through that now, a yeah, girlfriend yeah. of a girl. Faith. She's so sweet. Yeah, faith. 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 Yeah, faith. And faith. basic steps. Do one thing each day. Yeah, yeah that's Pray. right. That's one right. thing a day, and that's slowly. Right. Yeah. And, and, and people need the, the principle of prayer. When you pray... Pray one time and then just start thanking that you receive it. Because if you get up every morning, my hand hurts. I love that. Yes. And you know? just start thanking for receiving. Thanking That's for right. you, you don't so, have to every day beg. God, okay, I'll raise the stakes. Right. I will I will sell a house. You know, I will do there, this. Every money I get, I will give to charity. There's an old black yeah. woman that once said, she said, let me tell you something, honey, baby, God is not deaf. 
<laughs> you know, people do that so redundantly. So yes. one time and yes. just start, and start thanks. thanking. Yes. yes. Thank you. Amen, Amen to that. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. That's what it's all about. Thank you so much. Thank that you. God bless Thank you. you. That's so Thank beautiful. You. Thank Wonderful. You so much. Yes. Thank you.